you'll turn with me to the book of Hosea. I mentioned this last Sunday evening briefly. I said that as the week went on, I would look at it again. But I want to give you a foundational teaching and a foundation of why the gospel came and where the gospel came to and where the Lord said it would be a gospel of reconciliation and healing. And so if you go to Hosea chapter 6, please, let's read from verse 1. We'll just read the first three verses. Hosea 6 and verse 1 says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us. He hath smitten, he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his goings forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain to the earth. Let's pray. Father, take your word again and inscribe it in our hearts and print it in our minds and seal it within us, O God. And we pray, Father, that you would let us all see your great plan of redemption, your great plan of salvation. But, Father, through it all and in it all, preeminently may we see the Lord Jesus Christ. For he alone is worthy of the praise. We give you glory in his name we ask it. Amen. Hosea, the prophet Hosea and the book of Hosea which he writes, it's written to the northern kingdom of the house of Israel. And now the two kingdoms are this and I've told you throughout the week the northern kingdom with a capital in Samaria and there was the southern kingdom after the divide in 1 Kings 10 11 and around that area and whenever we look at this we see the southern kingdom with their capital city of Jerusalem the kingdom of Judah is in the south and the kingdom of Israel is in the north and so Hosea is the prophet one of the prophets to the northern kingdom and they've fallen into sin. In fact, in this time, in Hosea's day, it is thought that they are in a very prosperous condition. And the prosperity brought them nothing but further falling away from God. And that's what we find is with men and women who are prosperous, not all men and women now, but men and women who are prosperous or a people who are prosperous, they tend to forget God when all goes well with them. And the northern kingdom of the house of Israel forgot God. They forgot him because all was going well with them. They had great alliances with uh, Rezin or Rezin, the, the king of the Syrians. The Assyrians were coming against them and they had this united block and they fought against the Jews. And you'll read that also, that that was the first time you'll hear of Jews in Israel mentioned. They're fighting against one another. And you'll find that in Second Kings 16. Now notice this, Hosea prophesies like Elijah prophesied to the northern kingdom, Elisha prophesied to the northern kingdom, Amos the prophet prophesied to the northern kingdom, and so Hosea is another prophet who is prophesying to them, and as he's prophesying, he says through the preaching of the word and the repentance from sin, will God forgive them and heal their land, and they find that they don't want to turn from their sin. They don't want to change their ways. They want to live exactly the way they're living. And in fact, their morality has become so low uh, that their, their name is, has been so pulled down that the very nations are laughing at them. And in fact, when you go again into the book of Hosea, we'll not turn to it tonight, in Hosea chapter 1, you'll find God says to him, Go marry a woman of whoredoms, of the children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom against me in other words the the land of Fordham's wasn't the Assyrians or the Assyrians it wasn't the, the the Egyptians or it wasn't anybody else God was saying to Hosea take a woman from the house of Israel a Fordham nation because they've fallen far from me and notice this he does and Hosea represents the Lord in this and his wife Gomer represents the house of Israel and so you see the, the sin that they're in and God wanting to forgive. We find then after that that he says when they have children that one of them is to be called Loa Me and Lo Ruhama. And it means you're not my people and I will have 
uh, no more pleasure or no more mercy on you. And so he says he would scatter them and they wouldn't listen. And God pleaded with them through the prophet, but judgment came. Can I ask someone maybe tonight, and maybe you and yourself, you've known the gospel, you've heard the gospel, or maybe this is your first time really hearing something about the gospel of saving grace. And maybe you've known that God has been dealing with you for such a time and you've rejected him and you've turned him away and you've heard the word preached to you or maybe someone witnessed to you. Maybe someone has told you about the love of God found in Christ when he died for you at the cross. And they say, you know, he loves you and he wants to save you and he wants to forgive you. But you must turn from your ways and you must repent and you must come to him. And you must claim the merits of the precious blood of Jesus. And maybe you've heard these things and suddenly you realize God has been speaking to me for such a long time and I have rejected him. Such were the house of Israel. There's no difference between then and now. And still maybe you've rejected him. Do you know it is appointed on the man wants to die? But after this, the judgment. And so after this comes the judgment nationally to the house of Israel. And it comes to men and women. It could come today. It could come this evening. It could come to you at Christ's return. But we must be ready for the coming of the Lord. Can I ask you, are you ready? Are you saved? Do you know him as your own Lord and personal saviour? Are you ready? Don't walk out of here tonight now. Don't walk out of here tonight and, and say, well, I'll go another day. For you're not promised another day. You might have another day, but you're not promised another day. And don't walk out of here tonight saying, I'll hear thee of another time, like the king said unto Paul. And we never hear of him ever coming to Christ, or little do we know if he ever heard the gospel again. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. In other words, today, if you know Christ has been speaking to you, Today, if you know that you must be saved and born again of the Spirit. Today, if you hear that you must give your life to Christ now and trust fully, only, totally, uniquely, solely and completely on what he has accomplished, done and paid for you at Calvary's cross to say his death, his blood is enough for me. And then you say, Jesus, accept me and receive me as a sinner and turn your ways and turn to face the Lord. Don't walk out of here tonight and say, I'll wait to another time. And if you don't know Christ, don't walk out of here and say, well, sure, there's no responsibility on my shoulders because the responsibility lies squarely with the man and woman who reject Christ. And the responsibility is no longer this preacher's. The blood will not be upon my skirts, as it were. And so receive Christ if you know you need him tonight. Notice this, we're told in verse 1, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us, he hath smitten, he will bind us up. Now there's something important we must notice here. First of all, we see the Father smiting. The Father smiting. In verse 2, after two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. We're going to show you the prophetic utterance of this, and this comes then after the death of Christ. This comes into the Protestant Reformation when we hear that the just shall live by faith, when he starts to bind us and to make us right again and to make us whole. And we'll also find in this that this is the Son, the Father smiting, the Son reuniting us with God, reconciling us to God. And then in verse 3, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his goings forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain to the earth. Notice here we have the Spirit deluging, or the Spirit's coming. And what is the Spirit but God himself? Notice what it says. It says, he shall come unto us as the rain. And so the Spirit was poured out the day of Pentecost. And we'll look at that a little later on. But notice this. For he, God, hath torn. For he, God, will heal. When did God tear? He tore the nation into two kingdoms. He tore them through a hedge of the prophet, taking that coat of Jeroboam and tearing it into 12 pieces, giving 10 pieces for 10 tribes for the northern kingdom, 
to Jeroboam and two tribes for the southern kingdom to Rehoboam. And so he had two kingdoms and two capital cities, became two peoples, two nations, two sons are called, two sisters, two sticks and two houses, the whole way through the scripture from that. But notice this, this he hath torn, he will heal, he hath smitten. When did he smite? He, he smote them when the Assyrians came because of their sin and judgment came upon them. God allowed the enemy to be his chastening rod. God allowed the enemy to come in and carry them away captive. So he is smitten, but then the promise is he will bind us up. So torn by God, then only God can heal. Smitten by God, only God can bind. Only a sovereign, determined, decisive, deliberate move and act of God could do this work and complete it. And we find it all happens at Calvary's tree, at the cross of Calvary. And so when we look at this, we want to look at what has happened now. The northern kingdom are scattered around 100 to 120 years later, the southern kingdom of Judah again fall into sin. They don't learn their lesson. And so they fall into sin and are taken away into Babylon captive. And they're taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And we read of Daniel in the lion's den. We read of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And the fourth man with them in the fire. And we read of all of these things in Babylon. But also in Babylon was Ezekiel the prophet. And Ezekiel the prophet he writes something. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 34, please. Remember, as I've said, the word Jew is, where, is a derivative or derives from the word Judah. And so Judah are taken captive into Babylon. Ezekiel chapter 34. Listen to what the prophet says. That's where I run down to verse 16. The Lord's speaking, and listen to what he says. The Lord says, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. Notice the language. Who is God speaking about here? Those who were driven away, the house of Israel. Those who were driven away, the house of Judah. And he's saying this to Judah now. He's speaking mainly to those in the southern kingdom who are in Babylon. Let me just get my place. Verse 16, I will seek them which are lost and bring again that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was look broken and strengthen that which was sick. And I will destroy the fat and the strong and I will feed them with judgment. But as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between rams and goat. Seemeth it a small thing unto you that you have eaten the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of my pastures, and to have drunk with the deep waters, but you must foul the residue with your feet. For as for my flock, they eat that which they have trodden down with your feet, and drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean. What is God saying here? God says there are those who were his and those who are not. And God is saying, remember the cattle that Joseph saw? He, uh, 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 pardon me, Pharaoh saw and Joseph interpreted the dream, the fat cattle and the lean. Well, God sees the exact same spirit in Babylon. He says, I will judge between those who are legitimately my flock and those who are not my flock. Can I ask you something, friend? Are you his flock? I mean, are you saved in his flock? Are you part of his flock? Turn with me also again then back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And when you're looking to Jeremiah, go to Jeremiah 16. So now he's talking about those who are lost. Those who are lost. Jeremiah 16. Now when Ezekiel is saying this, he says, I will seek that which was lost and bring back that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken. The word lost there is a word avad. Avad and it means a lost wandering sheep. God said, even though they're taken captive, I'm going to do something that's great in the earth. 
And I am going to find the lost sheep. I am going to find them and I am going to reach them. And it is the wandering sheep or those who are in exile, it means. You can look that up when you go home. It means to bring back, it means to recover them. It means to turn one's face around to another. In other words, they're like the Gentiles. They're gentle eyes, to put it in brackets. They're heathen. They've lost their way. They're sinful. They don't know who they are. He says, but I am going to send forth my word and my spirit. He says, and those who hear my word through my spirit will turn my face onto, onto me. He says, and I will save them. Now notice this, it also means, this word bring back means, metaphorically it means, it gives the idea of a sinner being converted to repent. God says, I will cause them to repent. So when we go to Jeremiah 16, how do you do this, Lord? Notice this, Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 16. Notice what the Lord says. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill out of the holes of the rock. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is iniquity hid from mine eyes. God is saying this. I see their sin. He sees your sin. He says, your iniquity is not hid from mine eyes. God said that, not me. He says, I see your wells, I see your sin, I know all about you, but nevertheless, listen, I love you. I love you. And he says, I don't want to judge you. I want to save you. I want to forgive you. How does he do it? Verse 16, behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. Now let us cast our mind forward a lot of hundred years here to the shores of Galilee when Peter and Andrew and James and John are in their fishing boats casting or mending their nets and a man, a lonely, lone figure comes walking along the shore and he cries unto them, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Why did Jesus say that? Why did he proclaim it? And why did he shout it? Because he is Jehovah Yahweh himself, veiled in flesh, the son of the living God. And he came to reconcile us back to the Father. And he says, follow me, and I'll make you to become fishers of men. What was he saying to these disciples? He was saying, I'll send you forth with the gospel of my saving grace. How will you reach, friend, but by the gospel of saving grace? Jesus just didn't pick this little saying out of his head because it sounded fancy because they were fishermen. He was the one who gave the prophecy as Almighty God in eternity past and the pre-existent in his deity. He's the one who told Jeremiah, I will send for them fishers and hunters. Now the hunters speak about over land and fishers speak about over sea. And they dig up to see where the people are. They cross mountains, valley and dale and preach the word of God. This is important now. You might say, what has this got to do with the Protestant Reformation and prophecy? Just bear with me. Just bear with me. It's a lot to do with it. It's everything to do with it. Now notice this. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Let's just read. A few verses. Verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and you have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you evil for your doings, saith the Lord. Now notice verse 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries. Whether I have driven them and will bring them again into their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them and they shall feed them. And they shall fear no more and be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the day has come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall, and a king shall reign and prosper 
and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah, that's the southern kingdom, in his days, Judah shall be saved. And Israel, now they're gone in his days when Jesus comes, Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now note the gospel of grace being told to the prophet. The Lord says, I'm going to have them will be under shepherds. I'm going to have them that I'm going to raise up a righteous branch. Listen, there's only one righteous, and that is the Son of God himself. There's only one righteous, and that is Christ himself. And this is the son of David. In other words, he's from David's lineage, from the house of David, uh, from, the, uh, from the tribe of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here God himself is speaking of his son coming. And he's saying he's coming. Watch for him. For when he comes, he will bring righteousness to the nation. He will bring righteousness to the earth. He will bring righteousness upon all who will trust in him. My friend, Christian, listen. When you're saved, you know fine rightly, and so do I, that you have no righteousness of your own. You know fine rightly there's nothing you can do to be saved. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God. But when we come to Christ at the cross. And when we have bowed the knee and we have yielded our spirits and bowed the head and cried for mercy he and his love and grace has come to us and he has shed his blood and he accepts us as sinners before his throne oh here we find that it's his righteousness his righteousness alone that we live in can you start to see now the scriptures coming together this righteous branch is christ christ alone turn with me to jeremiah 31 the gospels right through the old testament you know that it's the whole way through it. Jeremiah 31. Let your eye just run down then to verse 31. Here it is. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them to the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, though I was in husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Here he's speaking of a new covenant. What new covenant? It's the covenant of the everlasting gospel, the covenant of blood, the covenant when Christ bled and died on Calvary's tree. And he says, I'm going to make this covenant with you. He says, I'm going to do it. And I notice this also. He says that it's not the covenant that I made with your fathers when I brought them out of Egypt. In other words, when he brought them to Sinai, when he brought them and Moses came down the mount with the Ten Commandments, and they had made idols to worship, and Moses smashed them, the two covenants, and then they had to be remade again. Do you remember that? Well, then after they're remade again, man falls at the commandments of God. Man falls at all the commandments of God. Do you know really we have broken every single commandment? You might say, well, I've never murdered anyone, but I'm sure you've been angry with someone in your heart for the wrong reason. Jesus says that's murder. You might have said, well, I've never stolen anything. What, really? Not even a little bit of time from your boss? You're a thief. You see how the commandments are broken? You might say, I've never told a lie. Well, then you've just have. Because you've just lied. There's the commandments and standing before God, then you stand as a liar. You stand as a thief. Can you see this? You're guilty as charged before God under the commandments. And so man falls in the weakness of his own heart and his depraved uh, nature and in his flesh. And so something must be done. That's why Israel went away. They went away into sin. And that's why you still go into sin. Because of a depraved nature. Because of the old man and because of the old woman. And notice this, the Lord says, I will make a new covenant. My son will come. He is perfect in all his ways. My son will come and he is sinless. He will keep my law. He will live a life you cannot live. And he'll die in your room instead. And he will pay your debt with his precious blood. And this new covenant, all who come under the fountain of shed blood will be forgiven of their sins. Listen, the word of God tells us, 
If any man keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he's guilty of it all. You know, and a few who say, well, I've led a great life and I haven't really sinned except for maybe just one of them, then God says you're guilty of it all. Adultery. I've never been adulterous, never with lust in your heart. You've just lied again. You've just lied again. Such as every man and woman. And God says, it's not like that covenant. I'm going to make a covenant. And it'll be in your heart. In other words, when you come to Christ, you fall in love with him. You fall in love with him. And he comes and lives in you. In the power of the Holy Ghost. God says he would do it. You see, salvation is completely... I'm totally off the Lord. Notice this. John chapter 10. Jesus says in verse 16. Other sheep. He said it to the Jews. Other sheep have I which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring. And they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold. And one shepherd. Now notice one fold. One shepherd. Now people say what's the fold? The two houses will become one. In Christ. It's the only place. The house of Israel and the house of Judah can become one in Christ. Two folds become one. And the Lord says that he would save his people from their sins. So it's only in Christ that we're forgiven. That the debt is paid. That the ransom, the redemption, and the reconciliation is made back to God. The ungodly is made righteous and the outcast is brought in. God, our Almighty Father, must work a work. He must work a sovereign move. And it must be by His sovereign will, through sovereign grace, by His eternal decree and His predestinating love, and by His elect divine providence. Only God can do it. You might say, I'm trying to work my way to God. Friend, I'll tell you something. No man, no woman can work their way to God. No. Look what Hosea 2 says. After two days, 6 and 2, verse 2. Pardon me, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. Now, we have seen how God smites, and it has to be a sovereign move of God to be able to reunite and this is how he does it in his son. But let us look at the prophecy of it briefly. We have mentioned it, and I don't want to dwell on it because I have another one I want to show you. For example, two days, after two days, he will revive us. Now, note this. In Luke chapter 10, we'll mention it again. We've mentioned it a couple of times already. In Luke chapter 10, there's the parable that Jesus tells of the man on the road uh, to Jericho and he is beaten up and he's left to die and the priest comes and the Levite comes and they cross across the road and leave him there and the, good, the Samaritan or the good Samaritan comes along and puts him on his beast and he pours in the oil and the wine and he takes him to the innkeeper and he gives the innkeeper two pence notice two pence and now he gives him two pence and he says whatsoever I owe thee when I come back I will repay you Whatsoever I owe you, when I come back, I will repay you. He says it to the innkeeper, giving him two pence. In Matthew chapter 20, we're told of the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And the workers in the vineyard are working for what? A penny a day. A penny a day. So if you were to pay them for two days, that would be two pennies. So two pence is for two days. A penny a day. Two pence is for two days. Now, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, we're told, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that a thousand years is uh, with the Lord is as, uh, uh, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So if one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day, and then we have two pence, a penny a day, that will represent 2,000 years. Okay, 2,000 years. So here he's telling the parable, I'm leaving the wounded and they're going to be bound up 
Israel were broken. Israel were smitten. And he says, I'm leaving the wounded. They're going to be bound up. And when I go away, when I come again, I'll repay you. Christ ascended into glory after his death, his burial, and his resurrection from the grave. And he ascended up to the right hand of God. And there he intercedes for us. And he is coming again. And he says, I'm coming. Two pence. Two thousand years. Ah, but it's after two thousand years, someone says. Yes. But if I owe thee any extra, he says, I will repay thee. In other words, he's not saying I'm coming back exactly 2,000 years, as many would say. So now look at this. Since we have this, here is a time scale to show us the beginning of, if you want, the Protestant Reformation. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now I notice this, the deportations of the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, started in 744 BC. And they kept coming different deportations. We looked at some of those, give you time scales of what had happened. We won't go into them all tonight again. The last deportation of the Assyrians coming and taking them away captive was in 676 BC. Let me say it again. The last deportation of them carried away was 676 BC. If you take 676 and you have two days, you'll be smitten and torn. And you take it that they're carried away for 2,000 years from 676. It brings you to the year 1324 AD. 1324 AD. Now what has that got to do with anything? Well, 1324 A.D. was the birth of John Wycliffe, known as the morning star of the Reformation. And you say, well, what has that got to do with it? Because it's everything to do with it. Notice this. God can only bind and heal through his word and his spirit. His word had been chained to a pulpit and written in Latin so the common person could not read it by the Church of Rome. But John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, he comes and he is born into this. If you'd have lived around that time, you'd have seen the Black Plague. If you'd lived around that time, you'd have seen the Black Plague going right across Europe. And the, look, God's about to do something and the old devil's going mad. And it's believed between, they don't know where it's between 70 to 200 million people died from Britain right to the far ends of, of Europe into Eurasia, or Europe means, meets Asia Minor. Nearly 200 million people, they think, died with this. And God was about to start blessing. God was about to start doing something. And also, a hundred years war between England and France was at this time. There was a lot going on. There was the greed, the idolatry, the darkness, the superstition, and the abuses of the Church of Rome. And the place was in complete darkness all over the place with them. And then sickness was there, and war was there. How could God ever reach anywhere like that? What hope have we unless God, listen, sovereignly moves? Oh, when I look at Ulster. In the state that she's in, I still have hope. Because our God's still on the throne. And he can sovereignly move. In this darkness, God moved. moved. John Wycliffe wrote and preached against the teachings of purgatory. And against the seal of indulgences and the doctrine of transubstantiation by the Church of Rome where the Mass where they believe the wafer of God is, they pray and that wafer turns into the literal body and blood, the sinew, the bone, and even the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they eat him, they're receiving Christ. Friend, they're receiving water and flour. Receiving Christ by faith. Receive Christ by faith in the gospels that are preached unto you. Receive Christ and the, the blood that he shed by faith. 
And in the midst of this darkness, John Wycliffe trained a group of poor preachers called the Lollards. And he sent the Lollards out two by two, preaching the word of God all over England. This is even before the Reformation really took hold. In Prague at this time, there was Jerome of Prague who was doing God's work. And there, there was Johann Huss or John Huss. And John Huss, I've been in, in where his church was, there's not much of it left. There's a wee bit sticking out of the wall for his pulpit. And I've been in his bedroom and I've sat in the windowsill looking out the window we used to look out of. You still go and see it. John Huss had to run from the Roman and Catholic Church for they were going to kill him because he said there was no salvation in the Church of Rome nor their transubstantiation. And they said, come back and he'll be all right. And when he came back, they took him and they burned him at the stake. And now listen, do you ever hear the saying, your goose is cooked? Your goose has been cooked. John Huss, his name means goose. And when they were burning him at the stake, one of them turned, oh, one of the Roman Catholic Church turned to one of those who were saved by grace, trusting in the blood of Christ and said, look at him, now your goose has been cooked. That's where that comes from. Now your goose has been cooked. Before he died, listen, talk about no prophecy in the church. He prophesied. He prophesied of a swan that would come or a great eagle. And no man would be able to stop it. And what was that? 100 years later, Martin Luther. He came along with 95 theses and nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral on the 31st of October, 1517. Notice this. Let me just read something that John Wycliffe had written. Listen to what he says. God's words will give men new life more than other words that are for pleasure. O oh, marvelous power of the divine seed, which overpowers strong men in arms, softens hard hearts and renews and changes into divine men, those who have been brutalized by sins and departed infinitely far from God. Obviously, such miraculous power could never be worked at by the work of a priest, if the spirit of life and the eternal word did not, above all things else, work with it. He is saying that none can save, nothing can change you. Now listen, friend, it doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic or you say you're a Protestant. It doesn't matter if, you, if you're in one tradition or whether you're in another tradition. It doesn't matter if you say I've been confirmed into the Catholic Church or been confirmed in the Anglican Church or I go to this church. It doesn't matter if you say I belong to a certain other church. Listen, if you're not saved, you must be born again. If you're not saved, you're lost. You're lost. This was the second day. After two days, John Wycliffe was born, and we go into the third day. Now, our first teaching was the importance of the third day, and that was last Sunday evening. We can't go into that again. John Wycliffe died on the 31st of December, 1384. 1384. 30 years later, such was the impact of his work, the Council of Constance ordered all his works to be found, to be destroyed. They ordered, the Council of Constance is a, a, was a Council of Rome, and they ordered his bones to be exhumed from the ground, to be burned, to be crushed, to powder and to ice, and to be cast into the River Swift. Bishop Fuller says this about this happening. Listen to this. I quote him, they burnt his bones to ashes and cast them into the swift, a neighboring brook running hard by. Thus the brook hath conveyed his ashes to Avon, from Avon to Severn, from Severn into the narrow seas, and they into the main ocean. And thus the ashes of John Wycliffe were the emblem of his doctrine, which now is dispersed the world over. <laughs> And what they had done is throw that ice and like seed it went down the rivers, he says, and into the seas. And such is the word of God. So stay with me. 
In the third day, Hosea 6 and 3, 2, pardon me. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. This is the, we're now into the third day. And we shall live in his sight. And how does this happen? Well, we have to look at the third day. I've mentioned Martin Luther. Because that's the next, after 2,000 years, John Wycliffe was born, we go into the third day. You and I are still living in the third day. The third thousand years. We are still living in the third prophetic day. And we're waiting on this finishing. It's coming to a climax because Jesus is coming. Now notice this. The five solas came from the early reformers. Sola scriptura. By scripture alone. Sola fide. By faith alone. Solus Christos. Through Christ alone. Sola gratia. By grace alone. Solo Deo gloria. Glory to God alone. That's the five solas of the scripture from the Reformation. All through his word and his own sake. Men like Holdrich Swingley in Switzerland, John Calvin in France started to raise up. And Elizabeth I even, she even had a Bible in her hand. Christian empire of Great Britain was, was built upon the word of God. And even when you bring it right up to Queen Victoria, she was asked by an Indian prince, what is the greatness of, what is the secret of England's greatness? She holds up the word of God to the Indian prince who says, this Bible, it's called the most precious thing in the world, is the secret to England's greatness. Do you know what would be the secret to Great Britain's greatness, UK's greatness, Ireland's greatness, America's greatness, and wherever else, Canada, wherever else? If they turn back to the Bible. If they get back to the word of God. If the preachers in the pulpit would preach the word. Preach the word instead of silly, stupid stories. So, thirdly and briefly, we want to look at Hosea 6. We have the spirit outpouring. And then we'll look at something else and we'll close. Time is flying. Turn with me again to Hosea chapter 6 and verse 3. It says, He shall come unto us as the rain, as the former, the former and the latter rain upon the earth. Notice this. The rain. He as the rain. Speaking of the Spirit coming, the Spirit is like the rain coming upon the earth. This speaks of revival happenings that then would happen at the preaching of the Word. The Word, uh, He will raise us up and He will revive us. The word revive and raise are slightly different. The word raise is the word he will cause us to be established. See, they were cast away out of their land. That means he will cause us to be established. He will cause us to arise. He will cause us to stand. That means he will cause us to become powerful. How did Great Britain become powerful? Through the word that was brought. The word revive here means breathing to cause to be well from sickness. Britain is a sick country. It's like when Isaiah prophesied to Israel and says, from the the top of your head to the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, you're full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Now notice this. We had the reformers. Or we then had after the reformers the Puritans. We had evangelical awakenings. We had the Wesley brothers. We had George Whitfield. We had John Knox up in Scotland. We had Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the 1859 revival, the Welsh 1904 revival, the Hebridean revival. We had the Holy Spirit outpouring, George and Stephen Jeffries, and Dan and Jones Williams and the apostolic movement there. God pouring out his spirit, the former and the latter rain. We had it all coming to our nation. Why? Because God said he would do it. He said he would do it, and he has done it. He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain. And of course, then, we had William Carey, missionary to India, Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, David Livingstone, missionary, and Mary Slessor, missionaries to Africa, among many others. The British and Foreign Bible Societies, 
95% of them of the missionary work came from the United States and the United Kingdom. There was Christian reform came, prison reform by Elizabeth Fry came, William Wilberforce lobbies to free the slaves. Lord Shaftesbury stops child labor. John Groom starts to help for the disabled, and Dr. Bernardo's helps the orphans, which we're well aware of. He is building us up. He's establish, establishing us. He's bringing us on in the gospel. He's making us into an empire. He's binding our wounds, and he's bringing it out that we would bring the gospel to all the peoples of the earth. He's reviving us through his spirit and his word. In Hosea's third day that we are living in, I want to show you something, and well, time is flowing on, but give me five minutes and I hope to close. Is everybody all right for five more minutes? Give me, turn with me to Revelation chapter 10. That might mean, that might mean 10 minutes. <laughs> Revelation chapter 10, please. John on the Isle of Patmos sees a wonderful vision. And he sees the Reformation symbolized in this wonderful vision. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1 says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face were as it were the sun, and his feet were as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand note, a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, and standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went into the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall be in thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. What does John see here but a vision of an angel which represents Christ? This angel, he is not that Christ is an angel now. Don't you get me wrong, please. This is a vision of he who makes heaven come to earth. The power pointing to heaven, one foot is on the land, the one foot is on the sea. Fishers of men, hunters over the land. Fishers on the sea, hunters on the land. The one with the little book open. The little book was the open Bible of the Word of God that was prophesied that would be open again to the house of Israel and to all who come under the sound of the gospel. Amen. He says, write these things because it's going to go Eat it in. Take the word in, he says. It'll be bitter. You see, whenever we talk about the gospel, people don't want it. It's bitter to them. And there are people who wrestle with the things of God because God says you must be born again. Christ said that. He says you must be saved and it's bitter to us. We don't want it. But when we start to eat, we find it so sweet to the taste. God had said this to Jeremiah too. And Jeremiah had the scroll and the books. Ezekiel seen it and he had his. God showed him the word and he says, the word will be in you. So friends, this little book open in Revelation 10. In fact, I have another study, but I'm not going to do it. I'll do it maybe some. Maybe we'll fight me back after this Sunday sometime. And this study shows the rainbow around his head. We see Christ in it. We see the eyes. We see the face like the sun from Matthew 17 when he's transfigured before uh, Peter and, on, uh, 
Peter, Andrew, and, and James, and he's, tra- and he's trans- or, sorry, Peter, John, and James, or Andrew, I will, and he's, he's transfigured before them. I'm getting out of back the front now. And he's transfigured, Peter, James, and John, that's it. And he's transfigured before them. And all these symbols are in this Revelation 10, and I haven't time to bring them all out. And this rainbow around, we haven't time to bring, this is a covenant. This isn't about gay pride. This is a covenant of God. And we see him saying, the little book open, he says, take it, eat it up, because you're going to prophesy, and you're going to preach. Ezekiel 37, we haven't time, write it down and look at it. He sees a valley of dry bones everywhere. And he says, Ezekiel, these bones are dry, very dry. Not skeletons, bones scattered in the wilderness. It speaks of, the, of Israel scattered all across the nations, across Europe. And, all. and he says, can these son of man or son of dust, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, O oh Lord, thou knowest. And he says, prophesy unto the bones and they shall live. So he prophesies and they start coming together bone to his bone. And he says, prophesy, he says, unto the winds or preach in the spirit. And the spirit causes them to stand on their feet like a great army. And that is another sign of the Protestant Reformation when they went across Europe and into Britain. The just shall live by faith. Salvation by grace through faith and nothing else, and in none other but the Lord Jesus Christ. So I finish with this. Let me tell you what happened in the third day. God's glorious word. John Wycliffe, 1324, he's born. Produces the first translation of the Bible into English from Latin. John Huss, Johan Huss, John Huss, and Jerome were starting to be raised up in Prague. In 1453, Greek scholars had to take flight from Constantinople and go west to Western Europe for safety. And they brought with them the manuscripts of the Word of God. We had also the knowledge of Greek starting to be taught more in the West then. Then in 1454, there was the invention of printing in Western Germany and in Holland. In 1458, the Greek language was first taught then in the European universities. In 1476, Caxton introduced his printing into England. In 1516, Erasmus printed the first Greek New Testament. In 1517, the 31st of October, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to Wittenberg Cathedral doors in Germany. In 1518, Huldrych Zwingli printed the first Swiss New Testament. In 1522, Luther's New Testament was, was in German. In 1526, William Tyndale's New Testament and the Swedish Bible was produced. In 1536, William Tyndale, when he, pardon me, when William Tyndale was being murdered, he cried out, Lord, open now the king of England's eyes as he was being burned at the stake. Henry VIII in 1539, just three years later, ordered a Bible to be put into every church that the ordinary man and woman could read it. And then we have 1537, Matthew's English Bible and the Danish Bible, all in Western Europe. Then we have 1539, the Great Bible, placed in every church by royal command. And 1611, the King James Bible, the book that changed the world. The King James Bible was printed. And then, of course, we still have that unto this day. Brothers and sisters, this is a wonder, and this is a great work of the Holy Ghost. And look, then came the outpouring of the Spirit. And the outpouring of the Spirit, we've seen it. The latter rain, the former and the latter. You know what the latter rain was for? The former rain was to soften the ground. Then we had showers like the Reformation coming, and the teaching, and the, re- and the rain was to start to cause the crop to grow. And so we started to grow, and we started to to have, I mean, Martin Luther, he, he continued on with the Mass for a while. So they weren't all perfect. They were getting revelation and revelation and revelation, and things were being taken out of the church that were error. 
And then after that came the outpouring of Pentecost. And that was the former or the latter rain being poured out. And what was that for? It's to mature the fruit in the Spirit. And it all came over to Western Europe. Why did it not go to China? Why did it not go to Africa first or India? Because Israel came west. That's why. Are you saved? Are you saved? If this is how accurate God's word is, the Lord says, you're not right with me. The Lord says, if your breath's taken tonight, you're going to be under condemnation. The Lord says, if you stand before me this evening, you'll find yourself in a lake of fire. The Lord says, you'll stand with broken commandment on you. And he must. He must punish it. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he punished his son for you. The father punished his only begotten son for you. And for you to reject him, and stand before God and say, I'm not a bad person. i never really done anybody any harm. The Father will say, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've broken my law. And I must punish eternally for it. What do I do about it? get saved. How do I get saved? Whosoever that's you friend tonight whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But I believe in the reformation it means nothing like a row of beans. I beat the drum and wear a sash it means nothing. I fly the flag, it means nothing. If you're not saved, if you're not saved, you're lost. Tonight's your chance. He says, My spirits are not always strive with man. I pray tonight you'll come to Christ. You'll surrender your life. Let's pray for a moment.